Chapter Fourteen of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers, Chapter Fourteen Epicurus. Epicurean, one who holds the principles of Epicurus, luxurious, contributing to luxury epicurism the principles of epicurus luxury sensual enjoyment gross pleasure the words with which this page is headed may be found in the current and established dictionaries of the present day and it shall be our task to show that never was slander more foul calumny more base or libel more cowardly than when it associated the words luxury and sensuality with the memory of the athenian epicurus the much-worn anecdote of the brief endorsed the defendant has no case abuse the plaintiff's solicitor will well apply here the religionists had no case the epicurean philosophy was impregnable as far as theological attacks were concerned and the theologians have therefore constantly and vehemently abused its founder so that at last children have caught the cry as though it were the enunciation of a fact, and have grown into men believing that Epicurus was a sort of discriminating hog who wallowed in the filth which some have miscalled pleasure. Epicurus was born in the early part of the year 344 B.C., the third year of the 109th Olympiad at Gargettus, in the neighborhood of Athens. His father, Neocles, was of the Aegean tribe. Some allege that Epicurus was born in the island of Samos, but according to others he was taken there when very young by his parents, who formed a portion of a colony of Athenian citizens sent to colonize Samos after its subjugation by Pericles. The father and mother of Epicurus were in very humble circumstances. His father was a schoolmaster, and his mother, Charistrata, acted as a kind of priestess, curing diseases, exorcising ghosts, and exorcising other fabulous powers. Epicurus has been charged with sorcery because he wrote several songs for his mother's solemn rites. Until eighteen he remained at Samos and the neighboring isle of Teos, from whence he removed to Athens, where he resided until the death of Alexander, when disturbances arising he fled to Colophon. This place, Mytilene and Lampsacus, formed the philosopher's residence until he was thirty-six years of age, at which time he founded a school in the neighborhood of Athens. He purchased a pleasant garden where he taught his disciples until the time of his death. We are told by Laertius that those disciples who were regularly admitted into the school of Epicurus lived together, not in the manner of the Pythagoreans, who cast their possessions into a common stock, for this, in his opinion, implied mutual distrust rather than friendship, but upon such a footing of friendly attachment that each individual cheerfully supplied the necessities of his brother. The habits of the philosopher and his followers were temperate and exceedingly frugal, and formed a strong contrast to the luxurious, although refined, manners of the Athenians. At the entrance of the garden the visitor of Epicurus found the following inscription, The hospitable keeper of this mansion, where you will find pleasure the highest good, will present you with barley cakes and water from the spring. These gardens will not provoke your appetite by artificial dainties, but satisfy it with natural supplies. Will you not then be well entertained? And yet the owner of the garden, over the gate of which these words were placed, has been called a glutton and a stomach worshipper. From the age of thirty-six until his decease he does not seem to have quitted Athens, except temporarily 
when demetrius besieged athens the epicureans were driven into great difficulties for want of food and it is said that epicurus and his friends subsisted on a small quantity of beans which he possessed and which he shared equally with them the better to prosecute his studies epicurus lived a life of celibacy temperate and continent himself he taught his followers to be so likewise both by example and precept he died two seventy three b c in the seventy third year of his age and at that time his warmest opponents seemed to have paid the highest compliments to his personal character and on reading his life and the detailed accounts of his teachings it seems difficult to imagine what has induced the calumny which has been heaped upon his memory we cannot quote from his own works in his own words because although he wrote very much only a summary of his writings has come to us uninjured but his doctrines have been so fully investigated and treated on both by his opponents and his disciples that there is no difficulty or doubt as to the principles inculcated in the school of epicurus the sum of his doctrine concerning philosophy in general is this philosophy is the exercise of reason in the pursuit and attainment of a happy life whence it follows that those studies which conduce neither to the acquisition nor the enjoyment of happiness are to be dismissed as of no value the end of all speculation ought to be to enable men to judge with certainty what is to be chosen and what to be avoided to preserve themselves free from pain and to secure health of body and tranquillity of mind true philosophy is so useful to every man that the young should apply to it without delay and the old should never be weary of the pursuit for no man is either too young or too old to correct and improve his mind and to study the art of happiness happy are they who possess by nature a free and vigorous intellect and who are born in a country where they can prosecute their inquiries without restraint for it is philosophy alone which raises a man above vain fears and base passions and gives him the perfect command of himself as nothing ought to be dearer to a philosopher than truth he should pursue it by the most direct means devising no actions himself nor suffering himself to be imposed upon by the fictions of others neither poets orators nor logicians making no other use of the rules of rhetoric or grammar than to enable him to speak or write with accuracy and perspicuity and always preferring a plain and simple to an ornamented style while some doubt of everything and others profess to acknowledge everything a wise man will embrace such tenets and only such as are built upon experience or upon certain and indisputable axioms the following is a summary of his moral philosophy the end of living or the ultimate good which is to be sought for its own sake according to the universal opinion of mankind is happiness yet men for the most part fail in the pursuit of this end either because they do not form a right idea of the nature of happiness or because they do not make use of proper means to attain it since it is every man's interest to be happy through the whole of his life it is the wisdom of every one to employ philosophy in the search of felicity without delay and there cannot be a greater folly than to be always beginning to live the happiness which belongs to man is that state in which he enjoys as many of the good things and suffers as few of the evils incident to human nature as possible passing his days in a smooth course of permanent tranquillity a wise man though deprived of sight or hearing may experience happiness in the enjoyment of the good things which yet remain 
and when suffering torture or laboring under some painful disease can mitigate the anguish by patience and can enjoy in his afflictions the consciousness of his own constancy but it is impossible that perfect happiness can be possessed without the pleasure which attends freedom from pain and the enjoyment of the good things of life pleasure is in its nature good as pain is in its nature evil the one is therefore to be pursued and the other to be avoided for its own sake pleasure or pain is not only good or evil in itself but the measure of what is good or evil in every object of desire or aversion for the ultimate reason why we pursue one thing and avoid another is because we expect pleasure from the former and apprehend pain from the latter if we sometimes decline a present pleasure it is not because we are averse to pleasure itself but because we conceive that in the present instance it will be necessarily connected with a greater pain in like manner if we sometimes voluntarily submit to a present pain it is because we judge that it is necessarily connected with a greater pleasure although all pleasure is essentially good and all pain essentially evil it doth not thence necessarily follow that in every single instance the one ought to be pursued and the other to be avoided but reason is to be employed in distinguishing and comparing the nature and degrees of each that the result may be a wise choice of that which shall appear to be upon the whole good that pleasure is the first good appears from the inclination which every animal from its first birth discovers to pursue pleasure and avoid pain and is confirmed by the universal experience of mankind who are incited to action by no other principle than the desire of avoiding pain or obtaining pleasure there are two kinds of pleasure one consisting in a state of rest in which both body and mind are undisturbed by any kind of pain the other arising from an agreeable agitation of the senses producing a correspondent emotion in the soul it is upon the former of these that the enjoyment of life chiefly depends happiness may therefore be said to consist in bodily ease and mental tranquillity when pleasure is asserted to be the end of living we are not then to understand that violent kind of delight or joy which arises from the gratification of the senses and passions but merely that placid state of mind which results from the absence of every cause of pain or uneasiness those pleasures which arise from agitation are not to be pursued as in themselves the end of living but as means of arriving at that stable tranquillity in which true happiness consists it is the office of reason to confine the pursuit of pleasure within the limits of nature in order to the attainment of that happy state in which the body is free from every kind of pain and the mind from all perturbation this state must not however be conceived to be perfect in proportion as it is inactive and torpid but in proportion as all the functions of life are quietly and pleasantly performed a happy life neither resembles a rapid torrent nor a standing pool but is like a gentle stream that glides smoothly and silently along this happy state can only be obtained by a prudent care of the body and a steady government of the mind the diseases of the body are to be prevented by temperance or cured by medicine or rendered tolerable by patience against the diseases of the mind philosophy provides sufficient antidotes the instruments which it employs for this purpose are the virtues the root of which whence all the rest proceed is prudence this virtue comprehends the whole art of living discreetly justly and honorably and is in fact 
the same thing with wisdom it instructs men to free their understandings from the clouds of prejudice to exercise temperance and fortitude in the government of themselves and to practice justice towards others although pleasure or happiness which is the end of living be superior to virtue which is only the means it is every one's interest to practice all the virtues for in a happy life pleasure can never be separated from virtue a prudent man in order to secure his tranquillity will consult his natural disposition in the choice of his plan of life if for example he be persuaded that he should be happier in a state of marriage than in celibacy he ought to marry but if he be convinced that matrimony would be an impediment to his happiness he ought to remain single in like manner such persons as are naturally active enterprising and ambitious or such as by the condition of their birth are placed in the way of civil offices should accommodate themselves to their nature and situation by engaging in public affairs while such as are from natural temper fond of leisure and retirement or from experience or observation are convinced that a life of public business would be inconsistent with their happiness are unquestionably at liberty except where particular circumstances call them to the service of their country to pass their lives in obscure repose temperance is that discreet regulation of the desires and passions by which we are enabled to enjoy pleasures without suffering any consequent inconvenience they who maintain such a constant self-command as never to be enticed by the prospect of present indulgence to do that which will be productive of evil obtain the truest pleasure by declining pleasure since of desires some are natural and necessary others are natural but not necessary and others neither natural nor necessary but the offspring of false judgment it must be the office of temperance to gratify the first class as far as nature requires to restrain the second within the bounds of moderation and as to the third resolutely to oppose and if possible entirely repress them sobriety as opposed to inebriety and gluttony is of admirable use in teaching men that nature is satisfied with a little and enabling them to content themselves with simple and frugal fare such a manner of living is conducive to the preservation of health renders a man alert and active in all the offices of life affords him an exquisite relish of the occasional varieties of a plentiful board and prepares him to meet every reverse of fortune without the fear of want continence is a branch of temperance which prevents the diseases infamy remorse and punishment to which those are exposed who indulge themselves in unlawful amours music and poetry which are often employed as incentives to licentious pleasure are to be cautiously and sparingly used gentleness as opposed to an irascible temper greatly contributes to the tranquillity and happiness of life by preserving the mind from perturbation and arming it against the assaults of calumny and malice a wise man who puts himself under the government of reason will be able to receive an injury with calmness and to treat the person who committed it with lenity for he will rank injuries among the casual events of life and will prudently reflect that he can no more stop the natural current of human passions than he can curb the stormy winds refractory servants in a family should be chastised and disorderly members of a state punished without wrath moderation in the pursuit of honors or riches is the only security against disappointment and vexation a wise man therefore will prefer the simplicity of rustic life to the magnificence of courts future events a wise man will consider as uncertain and will therefore neither suffer himself to be elated with confident expectation nor to be depressed by doubt and despair for both are equally destructive 
of tranquillity. It will contribute to the enjoyment of life to consider death as the perfect termination of a happy life, which it becomes us to close like satisfied guests, neither regretting the past nor anxious for the future. Fortitude, the virtue which enables us to endure pain and to banish fear, is of great use in producing tranquillity. Philosophy instructs us to pay homage to the gods, not through hope or fear, but from veneration of their superior nature. It moreover enables us to conquer the fear of death by teaching us that it is no proper object of terror, since whilst we are, death is not, and when death arrives, we are not, so that it neither concerns the living nor the dead. The only evils to be apprehended are bodily pain and distress of mind. Bodily pain it becomes a wise man to endure with patience and firmness, because if it be slight it may easily be borne, and if it be intense it cannot last long. Mental distress commonly arises not from nature, but from opinion. A wise man will therefore arm himself against this kind of suffering by reflecting that the gifts of fortune, the loss of which he may be inclined to deplore, were never his own, but depended upon circumstances which he could not command. If, therefore, they happen to leave him, he will endeavor as soon as possible to obliterate the remembrance of them by occupying his mind in pleasant contemplation and engaging in agreeable avocations. Justice respects man as living in society, and is the common bond without which no society can subsist. This virtue, like the rest, derives its value from its tendency to promote the happiness of life. Not only is it never injurious to the man who practices it, but nourishes in his mind calm reflections and pleasant hopes, whereas it is impossible that the mind in which injustice dwells should not be full of disquietude. Since it is impossible that iniquitous actions should promote the enjoyment of life, as much as remorse of conscience, legal penalties, and public disgrace, must increase its troubles, every one who follows the dictates of sound reason will practice the virtues of justice, equity, and fidelity. In society the necessity of the mutual exercise of justice in order to the common enjoyment of the gifts of nature is the ground of those laws by which it is prescribed. It is the interest of every individual in a state to conform to the laws of justice, for by injuring no one and rendering to every man his due, he contributes his part towards the preservation of that society, upon the perpetuity of which his own safety depends. Nor ought any one to think that he is at liberty to violate the rights of his fellow citizens, provided he can do it securely. For he who has committed an unjust action can never be certain that it will not be discovered, and however successfully he may conceal it from others, this will avail him little, since he cannot conceal it from himself. In different communities different laws may be instituted according to the circumstances of the people who compose them. Whatever is thus prescribed is to be considered as a rule of justice, so long as the society shall judge the observance of it to be for the benefit of the whole. But whenever any rule of conduct is found upon experience not to be conducive to the public good, being no longer useful, it should no longer be prescribed nearly allied to justice are the virtues of beneficence compassion gratitude piety and friendship he who confers benefits upon others procures to himself the satisfaction of seeing the stream of plenty spreading around him from the fountain of his beneficence at the same time he enjoys the pleasure of being esteemed by others the exercise of gratitude, filial affection, and reverence for the gods is necessary in order to avoid the hatred and contempt of all men. 
friendships are contracted for the sake of mutual benefit but by degrees they ripen into such disinterested attachment that they are continued without any prospect of advantage between friends there is a kind of league that each will love the other as himself a true friend will partake of the wants and sorrows of his friend as if they were his own if he be in want he will relieve him if he be in prison he will visit him if he be sick he will come to him nay situations may occur in which he would not scruple to die for him it cannot then be doubted that friendship is one of the most useful means of procuring a secure tranquil and happy life no man will we think find anything in the foregoing summary to justify the foul language used against epicurus and his moral philosophy the secret is in the physical doctrines and this secret is that epicurus was actually if not intentionally an atheist the following is a summary of his physical doctrine nothing can ever spring from nothing nor can anything ever return to nothing the universe always existed and will always remain for there is nothing into which it can be changed there is nothing in nature nor can anything be conceived besides body and space body is that which possesses the properties of bulk figure resistance and gravity it is this alone which can touch or be touched space is the region which is or may be occupied by body and which affords it an opportunity of moving freely that there are bodies in the universe is attested by the senses that there is also space is evident since otherwise bodies would have no place in which to move or exist and of their existence and motion we have the certain proof of perception besides these no third nature can be conceived for such a nature must either have bulk and solidity or want them that is it must either be a body or space this does not however preclude the existence of qualities which have no subsistence but in the body to which they belong the universe consisting of body and space is infinite for it has no limits bodies are infinite in multitude space is infinite in magnitude the term above or beneath high or low cannot be properly applied to infinite space the universe is to be conceived as immovable since beyond it there is no place into which it can move and as eternal and immutable since it is neither liable to increase nor decrease to production nor decay nevertheless the parts of the universe are in motion and are subject to change all bodies consist of parts of which they are composed and into which they may be resolved and these parts are either themselves simple principles or may be resolved into such these first principles or simple atoms are divisible by no force and therefore must be immutable this may also be inferred from the uniformity of nature which could not be preserved if its principles were not certain and consistent the existence of such atoms is evident since it is impossible that anything which exists should be reduced to nothing a finite body cannot consist of parts infinite either in magnitude or number divisibility of bodies ad infinitum is therefore conceivable all atoms are of the same nature or differ in no essential qualities from their different effects upon the senses it appears however that they differ in magnitude figure and weight atoms exist in every possible variety of figure round oval conical cubical sharp hooked etc but in every shape they are 
on account of their solidity infrangible or incapable of actual division gravity must be an essential property of atoms for since they are perpetually in motion or making an effort to move they must be moved by an internal impulse which may be called gravity the principle of gravity that internal energy which is the cause of all motion whether simple or complex being essential to the primary corpuscles or atoms they must have been incessantly and from eternity in actual motion epicurus who boasts that he was an inquirer and a philosopher in his thirteenth year was scarcely likely to bow his mind to the mythology of his country the man who when he was but a schoolboy insisted upon an answer to the question whence came chaos could hardly be expected to receive as admitted facts the fabulous legends as to jupiter and the other gods his theology is however in some respects obscure and unintelligible for while he zealously opposed the popular fables which men misname god ideas he at the same time admitted the existence of material gods whom he placed in the intervals between the infinite worlds where they passed a life undisturbed by aught and enjoyed a happiness which does not admit of augmentation these inactive gods play a strange part in the system of epicurus and it is asserted by many that these extraordinary conceptions of deity were put forward by the philosopher to screen him from the consequences attaching to a charge of atheism dr heinrich ritter who does not seem very friendly disposed towards epicurus or his philosophy repudiates this notion and argues epicurus was not in truth an atheist and alleges that it was a mere pretense on his part and that from his very theory of knowledge the existence of gods could be deduced this has been much litigated vide electric review for eighteen o six page six o six it is quite evident that epicurus neither regarded the gods in the capacity of creators controllers or rulers so that his theism if it be theism was not of a very superstitious character the god who neither created man nor exercised any influence whatever over his actions or thinkings could have but little to do with man at all if we attempt to review the whole of the teachings of epicurus we and they are defective and imperfect in many respects and necessarily so we say necessarily so because the imperfect science of the day limited the array of facts presented to the philosopher and narrowed the base upon which he was to erect his system we must expect therefore to find the structure weak in many points because it was too large for the foundation but we are not therefore to pass it on one side and without further notice it should rather be our task to lay good wide and sure foundations on which to build up a system and develop a method really having for its end the happiness of mankind we live two thousand years later than the athenian philosopher in those two thousand years many facts have been dragged out of the circle of the unknown and unused astronomy geology physiology psychology all except theology are better understood men pretend they are searching after happiness and where do they try to find it not here amongst the known but in the possible hereafter amongst the unknowable how do they try to find it not by the aid of the known not by the light of facts gathered in years of toil and sanctified by the blood of some of the noblest of truth's noble martyrs no but in the darkness of the unknown and unknowable in the next world question the men who fly to theology for happiness and they will tell you that the most learned of the theologians sum up their knowledge in the word incomprehensible 
is it wonderful that their happiness is somewhat marred here by quarrels as to the true definition of hereafter g h levis says of the epicurean philosophy that the attempt failed because the basis was not broad enough the epicureans are therefore to be regarded as men who ventured on a great problem and failed because they only saw part of the truth and we might add that christianity and every other religious anity fails because the professors expect to obtain happiness in the next life and neglect to work for it in the present one epicurus says no life can be pleasant except a virtuous life and he charges you to avoid whatever may be calculated to create disquiet in the mind or give pain to the body the rev habakkuk smilino of bethel says that all pleasure here is vanity and vexation in the hereafter and he charges you to continually worry and harass your mind with fears that you may be condemned to hell and doubts whether you will be permitted to enter heaven which is the best the philosophy of epicurus or the theology of smilino g h levis says epicureanism in leading man to a correct appreciation of the moral end of his existence in showing him how to be truly happy has to combat with many obstructions which hide from him the real road of life these obstructions are his illusions his prejudices his errors his ignorance the ignorance is of two kinds as victor cousin points out ignorance of the laws of the external world which creates absurd superstition and troubles the mind with false fears and false hopes hence the necessity of some knowledge of physics we can scarcely blame epicurus that he was not in advance of his time as far as the physical sciences are concerned and therefore imparted an imperfect system of physics we must with our improved knowledge ourselves remove the obstruction the second kind of ignorance is that of the nature of man socrates had taught men to regard their own nature as the great object of investigation and this lesson epicurus willingly gave ear to but man does not interrogate his own nature out of simple curiosity or simple erudition he studies his nature in order that he may improve it he learns the extent of his capacities in order that he may properly direct them the aim therefore of all such inquiries must be happiness we may add that the result of all such inquiries will be happiness if the inquirer will but base his investigation and experiments upon facts let him understand that as he improves the circumstances which surround him so will he advance himself becoming happier and making his fellows happy also remember the words of epicurus and seek that pleasure for yourself which appears the most durable and attended with the greatest pleasure to your fellow men. End of chapter 14 of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh Recorded for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina.